it's my pleasure to hand things over to you UU, UU board member Hillary Prochnow, who has the pleasure to introduce our distinguished guests. Hillary, thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. And it is great to see a lot of folks that I did get to see last week because I made it out of Austin and into D.C. miraculously. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read a few brief uh, introductory remarks and um, tell you kind of what we want to do today, if that makes sense. Um, so by way of introduction, um, Dr. Reddick is the Senior Vice Provost for Curriculum and Enrollment and the Dean of Undergraduate College here at UT. He previously served as the inaugural Associate Dean for Equity, Community Engagement and Outreach for the College of Ed here. Um, and he's a professor in higher education leadership, also has teaching appointments in our university honors program, African and African diaspora studies, He's a fellow at the Institute for Urban Policy Research and a visiting professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education. He has also worked in student affairs at MIT, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, and Emory. So he gets around. Um, Rich and his colleague, Lisa B. Thompson, also co-host their own podcast, Black Austin Matters. And I'm going to put that in the chat in case you want to look at that later. There you go. And uh, he was recently awarded the President's Award for Global Learning. And if you attended the session at the National Conference last week that his students who participated in that program led, you would have been blown away. And you would think that these are amazing students and that they had a really wonderful professor to work with. Uh, in that program. And you should all very much be aware of the fact that he is a past champion on Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy has also appeared on Win Ben Stein's Money and I think a few other things, but Rich, you can cover that later. <laughs> so um, to get us started, Rich thought we might start with a little uh, provocation back and forth about Boyer um, and our political context. So kind of a little uh, between two ferns, if you will. <laughs> um, so <laughs> you're welcome. Um, we would like to start there and then let Rich, you know, just share more about his thoughts on Boyer in our university. Um, and we'll leave plenty of time for Steve to moderate questions at the end. So if we can all agree to those rules. Um, so to enter into this discussion, I think there are two ideas that, uh, folks will want to hear about. First, obviously, we'll, we want to hear, Rich, your thoughts on Boyer 2030 and how it's being implemented and discussed here on our campus. And second, and not at all unrelated, is how we implement Boyer and how we do the good work we need to do in Texas, where as of January 1st, we can no longer have DEI offices, titles, or programs, thanks to Senate Bill 17. Um, so we'll start with Boyer specifically and then move into some broader points. Um, so Rich, you made my job as a UU representative and board member really easy because I was like, hey, can we talk about the new Boyer? And then that was it. You were like off talking <laughs> to everyone about it. I didn't even get to say anything. So thank you. Um, and given your intellectual background, you were already, uh, of course, very familiar with the 1998, the first Boyer Report, a blueprint for America's research university, universities and Ernest Boyer's own scholarship reconsidered from 90 and how That's they right. impacted undergraduate education. So just to start us off, can you sort of share what you've done to share Boyer 2030 on our campus and some of the work that uh, undergraduate college does that's reflective of the equity excellence imperative. Sure, uh, Hillary, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to the year staff. And, and thank you all for an amazing convening. I've had a chance to sort of connect with some colleagues who attended, including my students who absolutely uh, are incredible. And I'm really sad. We're in the middle of promotion and tenure here at UT Austin. That's why I couldn't escape uh, Austin, but I would have loved to have been there. So I hope to get to a future Euro convening. Um, so yes, I mean, you you described it really well, Hillary. So uh, my engagement with Ernest Boyer's ideas goes back to scholarship reconsidered. And I remember as a first generation Pell Grant recipient, as a student of color, all those experiences. And, and you know, what's the value proposition for a research university? What should we be doing 
particularly at a school like ours, it's the flagship, right? So we have a responsibility beyond, you know, people who are just simply in front of our classroom spaces and paying for tuition. We have a responsibility greater than that. Uh, and that really was appealing to me. And so I, I've always saw my role as a scholar is somebody who's supposed to be engaged in this work on the institutional level. That's what we do as we get paid to do all that good stuff. But what is the impact beyond that? And so um, Boyer's original report, I think, also animated those ideas. And so I, I felt really grateful. And oh, you all should know, before I came to this role, Hillary and I were just always discussing and chatting about these things when I was an associate dean. And when the 23rd report hit, I was just like, this is the framework we need. And it's, it just happens to be incredibly timely because talking about issues like equity, racial equity, socioeconomic equity, uh, gender, socio, uh, sexual orientation, um, ability status, all those different identity types. Um, sometimes we get really um, sort of cornered and we have to think about ways of reframing our conversations to different audiences. Um, I'm in an environment where um, some of that reframing is necessary by law. And what Boyer does is makes it possible for us to talk about things like the equity excellence imperative in ways that I think most people who are engaged in higher education um, can easily grasp, right? And I, I love the fact that there's 11 provocations that really cover the span of all the work that we do uh, at institutions like ours. And so in the undergraduate college here at UT Austin, I have lots of colleagues and friends. You also wave if you're at UT Austin, you're part of our team. Yeah, look at them, aren't they awesome? Um, we're constantly working in these spaces, accessibility, affordability, uh, world readiness, uh, all the pieces that are really what a 21st century education should be. And I, I think equally importantly, and, and this is why you, I often gravitate to world readiness because it encompasses so much. And it's a way of talking about our work to people who may not necessarily think that, oh, well, equity and excellence, those are scary words. And one of them means something else. And we're saying, no, you can't have one without the other. They're intertwined. And I, I think when I start talking to colleagues, and in fact, when we first started talking about the landscape uh, post-legislative session, one of the conversations, like, how do we advance the work that is equity-focused that we do, that is inherently tied to all we do? And we started finding Boyer as a vehicle to do that. We found phraseology, we found terminology, we found framings that were really helpful. And, and I'll just give you an example of one of the things uh, we're talking about. So in our Dean's Council's meetings, um, you know, sometimes we'll be uh, talking about something to do with how do we advance, you know, the work going forward, given the, the constraints that we might have in the state of Texas. And I'm like, look at how the board report defines world readiness. Look at all that's in it. Those are the things that we do in our spaces that may not be possible in an office configuration, but nevertheless happens. And so one thing you should know is that uh, Hillary's purview, the Office of Student Success, was formerly called the Office of Equity and Excellence. And that was a great launching point. People were like, what do you mean by that? And we could explain to them, we can't be excellent unless we have equity. We can't have equity unless we are excellent. So that was a great uh, starting point. And then when we had to change the name, that was another conversation we got to have with folks. It's like, we changed the name because of statute and policy, but it certainly does not dissuade us from doing the work that we have been continuing to do. I always tell people, um, you know, my research, whether you call it multicultural education, whether you call it, uh, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's the DEI space. That's what I've been doing my entire career, 30 years now. So I can't really reframe my work. It is what it is. And so I bring those framings to, my scholarly framings to the work I do uh, as, as the Dean and Senior Vice Provost and certainly as a scholar. So um, in a lot of ways, I, I think I'm sort of remaining true to uh, the work that was supported to me because again, I told you, I exemplify a lot of those things and the university experience was transformative for me. Um, I did not go to university thinking that I would work at one the rest of my life. Um, but certainly that's been the case so far. And I found when I, when I talk to my colleagues who, you know, probably aren't perusing a lot of higher education journals in their free time, um, they really appreciate having a foothold and they appreciate seeing Lynn Pascarella and Claude Steele 
uh, and, and Michael Crow discussing these issues because it gives it heft and resonance in spaces. We can say some leaders in our space are talking about these issues in a way that perhaps some people haven't spoken about. And what's really, I think, excellent, and I'll just make this point uh, really succinctly, is the associate deans in the academic spaces that we work in, uh, I think have been really excellent conduits for this work going forward. Uh, really making it a way of articulating the work that they've been doing, but also pushing us in ways we haven't uh, really necessarily thought about. And certainly one of the things I think higher education needs to do is start thinking about, in the United States at least, you know, our positioning as a global leader in this space. I'm not saying we're the only place that does great things, but I am saying in the aggregate, I think some of the work that's happening in the United States is noteworthy. And this gives us a chance to sort of say, this is something the world is looking to us to lead it. And what a great uh, sort of way. And I'll, I'll actually credit you for this, Hillary. You'll remember that um, Hillary said, let's order copies of the Boy Report to give to all of our deans. And we did that. So all of our deans have a copy somewhere in their shelves. Uh, and I'm not beyond you know, sending them clips of a PDF and say, by the way, this is in Boyer's on page 12. Uh, just to kind of point out some of these uh, provocations that really speak to the issues that we're dealing with. So I hope I answered that question. I, I I have a tendency to ramble, so you can prod me. And I don't see that you was, doing like stop. That was so. perfect, Rich. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to write down minutes and times where I'm going to cut you off, and you just you matched it perfectly. So good job. <laughs> so far, that's the first one. And that was the first one because <laughs> this one is a little stickier, um, and just. For everyone in the audience, Rich and I discussed this beforehand. I'm not springing anything difficult on him. <laughs> I don't want. I don't want. I'm not a horrible human being. Um, but uh, so so yesterday, Rich, you and I were discussing the recent New York Times article about the anti DEI campaigns, and I'm actually going to drop that link here in the chat real quick in case you didn't see it. Um. So we were discussing this article um, about the anti-DEI campaigns across the country and the emails and other documents that the Times obtained. Um, and given that the people who wrote those emails said the quiet part out loud, could you share your thoughts about the importance of groups like URU coming together in person? And maybe could you situate that practice of coming together historically and its potential for the historical moment that we find ourselves in. Um, and, and I think, you know, what, what does this have to do? What does this article and what does coming together have to do with allyship and co-conspirators? Oh, it's so well put together, Hillary. I think Hillary has a career in, you know, <laughs> post Oprah uh, broadcasting. I think. <laughs> really well said. So, um, the front of our university's uh, tower, the main building which I'm in, we have an inscription. It says, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set ye free. Uh, and, you know, one of the important things that the reporting from the Times has done is, is made the truth apparent, right? So um, if there ever was a suspicion that, you know, this is sort of an organic sort of concern versus something that is really fueled by, uh a network of, of, of folks who really are, I think, are opposing uh, some of the civil rights progress we've made in the last, you know, 60 years. I, I think that's helpful, right? So it's important to know, uh, first of all, what we're dealing with and the fact that this is happening in different places. And, you know, just for all the clarification necessary, I speak as a scholar in this space. So, um, you know, hope nobody thinks that, you know, I am speaking ex officio on behalf of the university. I'm speaking as somebody who is uh, interrogating these issues uh, as an academic. Um, so I think it's important to understand that because one of the things that I get to do in my work is both in a national and international scale, talk about the context of higher education across the country and the world. And, you know, a lot of my colleagues in places like Texas and Oklahoma and Florida and other places are you know, having some of the same challenges, right? And it's helpful to sort of piece these things together, right? Um, it's also helpful, I think, when we think about the critical role that we have as 
scholars in our space. And I consider us all scholars. Some of you like, well, you know, I'm not writing articles and you know, publishing stuff, Rich. We're all scholars in the space. Um, scholar activists, scholar leaders, scholar administrators, whatever, we're all scholars. Um, the importance of this period of finding each other and exchanging ideas with each other to sharing hope with each other, to strategizing with each other is critical. Um, especially when many of us are in spaces where that's been constrained, right? Um, I've had the benefit of uh, talking to some leaders I really admire and respect, people like Julie Garcia, people like Ruth Simmons, and they are very clear about the importance of connecting with uh, folks who you are sharing uh, the same work with. And a lot of times, these kinds of contexts, if, we're in a, if, if this is a period of retrenchment, for instance, if that's what this is, uh, what's really important is that we have the ability to look in the space and see, I see people across my institution, but also across my state, and across my region, and across this country even, who are working on similar issues. And, and one of the most critical things I think about any movement, I study student activism. So, you know, I think about the importance of interest convergence and finding ways to uh, find touch points and think about, well, if there's things that you can't do where you're at, are there things that I can do in my space? This is the idea of uh, co-conspiring or, or even allyship, right? You know, how do we work with each other and how do we start talking about um, the sector of higher education as a cohesive whole? And that's what Yuru does, right? Um, I, I think a lot of times, and Hillary and I had this conversation, like, you know, um, one of my favorite books is a book called The Big Necessity by Rose George. It's about sanitation. It's a great book. But uh, at one point, she's kind of lamenting how sanitation issues worldwide create all kinds of auxiliary secondary issues that you think have nothing to do with actual running water and toilets, right? And she kind of laments, we need a bono for sanitation. And we were saying, who's the bono uh, for um, higher education? Well, it's your room, it looks like. Um, and, and maybe we can get Taylor Swift to join in and maybe we can get Beyonce to, 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 to fill in as well. But we definitely need to be talking about what we do as a sector and almost removing it from some of the more inflammatory flashpoints. And because there's always exemplars that people love to, oh, this is, they're doing this at the university. They're doing this at the university. And the reality is, when you think about the work that you do uh, 23 hours of the day, it's really helping students reach their full potential, right? And that's students who come from first generation backgrounds, students from rural areas, students who are veterans, you name the population. Uh, people in this room are all about doing that work. And, and a lot of times when I talk to colleagues or friends outside of higher education, they'll give me a trope. Well, I heard this is happening. And I'm like, you know, yeah, that does happen in higher education. But let me tell you the story of a student I met today. And this student, um, you know, is food insecure, and we're able to provide resources for the student. That's really more what we do. And I don't want to act like the more provocative and exciting things are not part of what we do, because I love that about universities. I love the fact that I can tell you on a day last year, uh, the former vice president of the United States, Mike Pence, came down my hallway to use my inclusive uh, gender inclusive bathroom. And later on that evening, I had a group of students who were speaking about gender fluidity in the context of traveling abroad. That was all in the same day, in the same space, you know? And that's what I love about the university. We have those kinds of exchanges. And, and I think um, the excitement I have about um, sort of the moment is that we have an opportunity to really start thinking about sharing uh, with our colleagues outside of the higher education context the work that we do and, you know, not shying away from the things that might be controversial in some senses, but also embracing the fact that, um, you know, truth, we work on truth here. And sometimes the truth is uncomfortable. Sometimes the truth is challenging to orthodoxy, uh, but it also requires reflection. I think we are also a reflective space and that's a lot of people don't understand it. I often get asked, and it's different now in an administrative space. I do have a boss, but as, a, as an academic, you know, well, my bosses are the peer review community. That's my boss. You know, if I'm doing something wrong, I'll find out from them. But it's an interesting way. But we also don't have very many analogs to what higher education looks like. And so I think a lot of it is sort of communicating to a broad public about what is it we do at the university. Um, 
but also doing it in a way that's accessible and understandable. I'm first gen. So uh, one of my goals as a scholar is that I don't ever do work that my parents and my extended family can't understand. And yes, there's jargon in there sometimes, but for the most part, I like to think that I can go and tell people, well, we're working on this and this is the impact we have. And it impacts people who go to our university, but it also impacts people in the Austin, the Texas, the United States community. Um, and the world. Rich, thank you for that, Rich, because you teed up question number three perfectly and without even knowing it. Um, uh, Steve, I didn't know if you wanted to welcome our our new uh, Boyer Commissioner. Thanks, Hillary. Yeah, welcome to Peter McPherson, the co-chair of the Boyer 2030 Commission and the president emeritus of APLU. We'll, we'll circle back. We'll give him a word in edgewise after we get to that point. Thanks, Hillary. Awesome. Okay. So, so Rich, I really, you really did sort of lead into this, this third question. And I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there and then you can just go on for, you know, as long as you think is appropriate, <laughs> maybe a little less than that. Um, but, um, and then, and then we can make sure we have plenty of time for, for folks to ask questions. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll give you the high sign, Rich, and stop, or maybe Steve will. Um, but <laughs> so, um, so really my third question, because this is, I mentioned this last week at the URU National Conference. Um, so, the responsibility that we have to the public, um, and, and we've talked about it before, and it's it's not a secret that higher education has not always done a great job of conveying the importance of our work in ways that are meaningful to people outside the academy. Um, so, but I that's a sacred responsibility for me, especially for um, public research institutions. And what are your do you want do you want to share any more thoughts about that responsibility and is there a connection between that responsibility and the challenging moment that we find ourselves in right now you know absolutely right so um when i think about it and most this has happened in so many places in california and texas we have those reports that say for every dollar you put into higher education you get this much money back and I often talk about the Faustian bargain of higher education, right? So post-World War II, GI Bill, we started making this very strong uh, equalization of higher education equaling higher incomes post-graduation, right? And we still do pretty well at that, maybe not as well as we used to. But, you know, one of the things is, of course, is that the university has multiple sort of functions, right? And one of those is an economic engine. We certainly do that, right? But we also defend democracy. That's a Julia Garcia uh, sort of uh, quote I always tell from her. It's like, you know, the job of the university is to defend democracy, right? It's to uh, develop and engage citizenry. It's develop critical minds, right? Um, and, and frankly, uh, that's threatening, right? Especially to people who oppose democracy. Uh, and, and so the other thing, of course, is our work is complex at the university. We do a lot of different things. Uh, I told you I'm in the middle of reading promotion and tenure files. So from our fine arts faculty to our engineers to our humanities scholars, I'm looking at all these different things that we all do. It's it's mind blowing the scope of the work that we do at the university and your universities as well. Uh, and so um, we have to sort of become, find a vocabulary and I think it exists. I don't think it's, we're not the only industry or the only space or endeavor that has complex things happening. Um, but when I think about this university, when I read files, the number of scholars who are spending time supporting Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops or doing things like our STEM day and our Girl Day here on campus that are truly embedded in the communities, right? So um, look, people run labs, those are important spaces. I know there's been a lot of time in them, but I wanna say the average scholar that I'm engaged with is doing that plus working on their PTA in their community. Plus, you know, doing something that, you know, brings their work to a more broader public. Uh, and, and, you know, we talk about patents a lot and that's really important. A lot of my friends in, in the engineering field are able to do that. And like, here's the monetized value of what I do. Uh, for some of us, it's a little bit more abstract, but nevertheless, you know, um, contributing to society and improving society in important ways is, is what universities do. And I, I kind of feel, Universities and colleges are often viewed the same way 
that the political landscape is, which you don't like the politics generally, but you're a person you like. So maybe people like their university and the one that they're most familiar with, but the other ones are doing all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and, and, you know, I remind people like uh, academic freedom, you know, Lair Freyheit and Learn Freyheit, you know, those ideas that really fuel the enlightenment are super important things that we do. So because somebody in this space with the protection of academic freedom will voice this isn't the way it's supposed to be, or this is a different way of understanding this phenomenon. And so many things we take for granted in the scientific world, you know, came out of spaces where people had the ability to do that kind of work. Um, and a lot of times the translation is challenging, right? Because, you know, well, you know, you're publishing articles. What does it got to do with like gravity? <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to sound grandiose on this whole thing, but uh, the fact that here in our community, uh, when things are happening in the political sphere or the judicial sphere or in the environmental sphere, oftentimes the people who are accessed are people who work in institutions like ours, right? Uh, and also the fact that a lot of people who are doing that work are learning through that work. So we have our graduate students engaged, our undergraduate students engaged in this work. Uh, so the real value that universities have is being parts of communities, not a part of com apart from communities. Um, you mentioned a lot of places I worked at and all those institutions you know, had to navigate town gown uh, sort of challenges and some better than others, right? Uh, but when you think about the global community, I mean, I think we are the place where those things can happen. And I'll go back to the fact that in the United States, we are, we benefit greatly from having um, a diversity uh, backgrounds and experience that we can really tap into. And that should be, in my opinion, that the forefront of what we do. We're in a, we're in a place where I'll use my example in the state of Texas. The languages, the identities you see walking on this campus are, are just, everybody's here, you know. I'd like to see more people from certain communities, but certainly um, it's an amazing experience that our students have, our faculty have, our staff have in this environment. And I just think that's something we should be talking about and, you know, quite frankly, uh, proud of. And I think sometimes we're kind of accepting the fact that, you know, the culture wars have kind of come to the front door of the campus and we should shy away from it. And I don't think we should necessarily do that. I think we should be um, proud of the work we do, but also because we work in a space of peer review and, crit and critical feedback that we can also listen to things that are, you know, maybe we're not serving community as well as we could. That's valuable to me too. That was the... Third question. I'll keep asking questions because, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think, I don't think that's what people signed up for. Um, so I, you know, Rich and Steve, with the time that's left, Rich, do you want to keep going? You want me to lobby some, some really difficult questions your way? Um, <laughs> well, I think, you know, it might be great. Uh, I know a lot of folks are here and, you know, there might be something that folks are, stewing over or thinking about and i'm not going to pretend to be the authority in all these things it's actually pretty intimidating considering who's on this call um there are a lot of folks who are really well versed in in our in our field but certainly it'd be great to hear some questions from folks in the, in the zoom or if you want to ask questions or curate questions whatever works best i i'm, I'm here for all of it Hillary, why don't we ask if we'll see if there are a few questions from the group. Is that okay? And if if there's a lull, you jump in there with the tough one, right? Sound good? So save uh, me. Just to remind, <laughs> <laughs> look at Hillary. She's a master at that. Well, why don't I just remind everyone we are being recorded? We would love to have you use your raise hand function so it's easier for me anyhow to see who's uh, next in line. But I'd like to begin and offer as a privilege um, the first question to members of our Boyer 2030 Commission who have joined us. That could be either Peter McPherson, if he has a question, or Sarah Newman, or Beth Loazzo, if, if either any of them or all of them have a question. I can't see, I'm not seeing if anyone's raised their hand. I raised my hand, Peter. I'm I'm sorry, Steve, I'm happy to ask a question. I don't know. Off you it. go. Thank you. Thanks um, for me. Thank you so much, uh, Richard, for this. It's so heartening. I was just messaging Steve on the side chat. It's so heartening to hear uh, a human talking about the work that we did being valuable and being used, because that's the whole point. And um, it's really inspiring to hear what you shared. So thank you. Um, 
I'm Newman, I'm one of the commissioners. Um, and I had a two part question. One is from all you shared that has been positive and helpful. I'm wondering if there was anything that you, you wish had been there and wasn't or um, other sort of, I mean, just, you know, this is somewhat selfish. I'm just genuinely curious. Like, did anything feel missing to you? Um, and the second part of the question is something that felt strangely timed from, from my side was, and probably from all of our sides was the release of all the large language, the public large language models soon after we published the report and not addressing, while we talked about um, technologies and we talked about chatbots and we talked about digital interventions, we didn't talk specifically about some of the ethical privacy, other issues that are raised by uh, large language models in particular. So curious if you have any um, reflections on that being a gap based on what you're seeing at UT. Well, thanks, Newman, and and I'm glad. I know what it feels like to say, like, "Hey, this actually is helpful to me." So I'm, I hope that everybody who uh, helped author uh, Board Twenty Thirty feels that. So um, I was actually going to make a point about something that was really well done, and that is the discussion on free speech. So um, you know, free speech has become obviously incendiary right now, and, and folks are sort of aligning themselves, and we actually saw that. Uh, as Elise Stefanik reminds us, the most viewed um, congressional hearing apparently of all time or something. But um, what I thought was really great is that Claude Steele's sort of discussion of the importance of free speech while understanding that not everybody has been equally served or had the prominence and privilege of voice. That is such a hard thing to describe to some folks because Anytime you're in a conversation and um, give you an example, here on our campus, the beginning of the school year, uh, there was a gentleman on the corner of our campus and he was saying horribly objectionable things uh, to students, not individually, but just kind of saying them. And of course, you know, we were very intentional about educating our students about what rights this person had. Um, but I was able to actually use the Claude Steele excerpt to kind of talk about, well, here is, here's a way of understanding why free speech is sort of differently weighted for different populations, right? Um, it's a very nuanced point because you never want to be accused of, you know, silencing or, you know, throttling speech in any way, but you want people to understand that for some folks um, who have been historically marginalized, you know, that can be a very threatening environment to operate in. I thought that was really well sort of articulated. Now, to your point about, you know, what are the things that we wish? And I think you're right. Exactly. Um, we are on the precipice. Uh, and I think Boyer uh, 2030 came out right as, you know, ChatGPT4 came out and all those things started happening where now it kind of was an abstraction. I think all of us in our institutions are dealing with some sort of thing. How do we use AI in our advising processes? How do we use AI in different uh, processes? Obviously for the good, but you know, I'm really excited. And I saw Patty Moran on our on our call. Oh, there's there's Patty. You know, um, Patty heads our first year experience, and we actually do our um, annual or our semesterly um, lectures. And one lecture we had was one of our ethicists in AI <laughs> talking about we need to start thinking about how this tool can be used for good and what are the ethics around it. So I, I think maybe an addendum is on its way or <laughs> or some discussion of that because I think every institution is thinking about, and of course you all get the emails every single day, right? Hey, we've got this AI tool to help you do this better. And I think the allure of serving students better and more efficiently is always there. But then what are the, and of course, uh, Andrew Ho, oh, my, my good friend at Harvard always talks about, hey, you know, AI reflects back the things that are within us. So we see the biases or the shortcomings of AI. That's us, right? Um, and I, I think it's a really interesting thing because there's one of the things we thought about, I think, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Xer and I was in school in the 90s and the internet boom and all of a sudden there's going to be all of this equity and everything's going to work out great and we realize these um, technologies have allowed us to basically digitize our biases. And without that kind of reflection, we're going to have those same problems. So I uh, would love more conversation about that. So that would be fantastic. But thank you for your work. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the comments, Richard. Sure. Who, who's that colleague at Harvard who you referenced, Rich? Andrew Ho, the College of Education. Oh, I mean, the School of Education. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. He did a great piece for us about equity 
and AI. And most people are like, huh? And he just blew it away, as, as you know, Newton. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Do, do Peter or Beth, do you have a question or should we just move to have raised hand function so that I, I can just move forward? I don't I... have anything right now. Beth? No, raise hand function, good people. Move forward. I think Move other forward. people. <laughs> Sounds good, good. Beth. At our... Well, if no one raises a question, you know what's going to happen. That means Hillary jumps in with one of those really <laughs> hard questions. And oh, Rebecca, there you are. Thank you. Hey, Rich. Um, hey, I, have a, I have a question about language, and it's not a I didn't write this question down, so I'm going to try to articulate it intelligently, but you'll know what I'm getting at. Language is such a moving target in our current environment. And, um, you know, for those of us who've been working on equity for decades and uh, for DEI in general, um, it's so we're, we're having to sort of constantly scramble, question ourselves, censor ourselves, obviously, and we get, we're get we getting legal guidance in a state like Texas and in the University of Texas system and our institutions. But what I'm noticing is there's there's language we think is going to be workable and acceptable, and yet we then find out that even words like access or belonging are under attack um, across some sectors. So I'm just wondering, any advice for how we navigate this very um, fast-moving dynamic environment, and yet not like totally capitulate <laughs> all our words? I'm just, you know, I'm grieving some light language last year, and yet I want to be really sensitive how we do the work. Yeah, Rebecca, thank you for that question. And I think we've all, those of us in in in, in environments where, where we're dealing with these kinds of issues, we sat around a table and tried to find synonyms for words um, like equity, which actually is the constitution. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I, what I, and this is why I think, again, Boyer is really powerful. I think when I talk about world readiness, and I talk about what that entails. I can talk about what is often, I think, in the space of what's considered to be either touchy or dangerous or words that could get us into trouble, so to speak, but it's the same thing. And, and I discovered years ago, I don't know who told me this. It might've been my idea, probably not. But in the fairness, I'm gonna make sure I make it clear that I'm not sure if this is my idea. But um, maximizing human potential is what we do at cities. And maximizing human potential is done through providing resources to make students feel a sense of belonging and connection. So Terrell Strayhorn's work, I, I've gravitated towards for years in that area. I, I just think it's really important that uh, we, first of all, don't lose sight of the fact that we have empirical and research space to talk from, right? We're not talking about abstract ideas. And um, there's, those are fine, but um, I just wrote a book, Restorative Resistance in Higher Education, Leading in the Era of Racial Reckoning. Reckoning. Um, it's a long title, and I was able to actually say it after writing this book for like about a year and a half. But in the book, you know, I talk about how we need to start thinking about the issue of reframing our language uh, over issues that have often been sort of uh, assigned to a certain political vantage point or a certain um social justice orientation and certainly many of us approach this work from that orientation i want to value that and honor that but i know people who approach the work from an efficiency perspective well if i'm going to hire somebody to work in my organization and they can only sort of give me 20 percent of their all because they feel constrained or they don't feel that they're included i want to do something about that and i did not have my bingo card as Mark Cuban being a defender of equity in education, but he did that. And I don't know if people saw his uh, Twitter thread, or I guess it's an X thread now, but he kind of walked through why he in the corporate sector, why he's so uh, such an embracer of what we call DEI, right? Uh, and he walks through a very specific examples about making sure he has the broadest pool of talent to draw from, that he makes sure that he makes better decisions. And of course, the research base that is in mostly in the organizational behavior space is that we find that diverse work teams, you know, may actually start the work and be a little bit slower, but they come to better decisions, right? That's something that um, we shouldn't lose sight of. And, and, and I just think that's 
critical. And I've, I've been in spaces, Rebecca, where I don't think the people in the space would politically align with social justice. But when we start talking about how do we maximize the greatest potential in every single one of our students that attends here? Um, and we all know that, you know, entrepreneurship has been something the United States has heralded. And it's often the place where people come from very far places and they come here and they're able to bring those ideas to fruition. And that's just an example of it. How do we make sure that can happen? What are the conditions to allow it to happen? And I'm also a big believer in universal design. So if we do things that help some students feel a sense of belonging, all students feel a sense of belonging. So things like uh, food pantries and things like, uh, you know, clothing closets are, are things that you might think, well, the students that use that are in a certain category. And obviously, maybe the students who do, but there are students who don't fit that category who benefit from that. And there are students who are like, I don't use that resource, but I'm glad it exists because it means my peers are more comfortable and can be engaged in a way and they're not worrying about things. And I, I, I always give a very personal example about this. When I was an undergraduate student, I was nominated for a student award and I did not have a pair of shoes that fit me. And this is before jeans, I mean, uh, suits and like Jordans were a thing because I did have that. But in 1994, I don't think it was quite the fashion statement it is now. And so I had to borrow shoes from a, from a friend of mine and the shoes were too big. So I ended up shuffling down, those of you at UT know this, 21st Street's a big hill. So I was kind of shuffling down there because I couldn't walk because my feet would come out the uh, shoes. And I, the whole time I was thinking to myself, I don't have a pair of shoes that fit me. And of course I go in for the interview. I'm not really as conducted as I, I didn't get the award. I'm just, why I didn't get the award. But anyway, I mean, it's an example of the fact like, wow, I'm glad that we have those resources available because now you can go and get a pair of shoes that fit you and have your interview and worry about that. You know, so um, I just think that that's a way I found of talking to folks and, and also in allowing and empowering people to understand that maximizing human potential doesn't really have a political sway. So I think there is a conservative, there is a progressive, there is a centrist perspective about why keep creating our spaces where everybody can participate, everybody can take advantage of the resources we have is a good thing. and. One thing I will say for people who work in my space, um, I think we could be more inclusive and supportive of people bringing other ways of understanding why equity and belonging matter, right? Because sometimes people are like, well, that's not the reason why I believe it matters. Uh, I, I'm kind of a big believer in the fact that if you are in the big tent, we can have the discussions amongst ourselves, but let's get in the tent together, first of all. And, and I've been actually surprised to hear a number of people in Unexpected spaces say, I care about this. And let me tell you why. And the why is like, well, I don't, that's not really why I come at it that way, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> let's start with that. And let's see if we can um, uh, build um, a, a connection there. Cause we don't have to agree on every single thing, but I do think that's a critical piece. And, and frankly, if we're going to sort of have a strong response to the current sort of uh, environment, I think we have to start thinking about, well, who, who else in our universe and our communities thinks this is an important thing? And I've talked to colleagues who have said, you know, I, I'm able to do work in spaces because maybe I can typically resemble people and that's an advantage I might bring or privilege I might bring. But also I try to find people where they're at. I try to find people, you know, you care about workforce development. Let me tell you how your workforce can be more efficient. You know, you care about social justice. Let me tell you how you can be more just. Whatever tends to be the thing, because I think what we end up finding out is these are goods for all of the work that we do, not just for a subset. And and that's probably part of the framing challenge we have. I hope that's helpful, Rebecca. I mean, that's... Well, just... you know, go, go ahead. Sorry, Steve. I just want to say that, Rich, you literally answered the question that I was writing down um, in terms of talking about universal uh, design for learning. But and then folks who were at URU uh, last week remember Dr. Tia Brown McNair's uh, keynote on, um, on on building sort of a capacious definition um, of success which is like, we shouldn't, 
like our goal is not these students are up here and these students are down here and we want to close that gap. It's, it's, it's a more universal thinking about the issues that we are really concerned with, right? Like our goal isn't these, these guys are doing good. So let's get everybody up there. How can we think about making it better for everyone? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. So um, I love the fact that so many of our students are, are, are coming to campus and they're talking about neurodiversity and, and they're talking about understanding and framing the world differently. And I, I think that's a hugely critical way of understanding that success is going to look different for all of us. And, you know, I want to get very clear that um, I'm thinking about a friend of mine who's a chemist and is always saying precision matters. I agree with that. And, and certainly there are fields of endeavor where that's critically important. I have a friend who's a pharmacist, same thing, you know, Dosage matters, right? Getting it exactly right matters. Um, but one of the things I think that's valuable about university settings is that a lot of times you go into that environment and then you encounter a topic or an issue or an area of inquiry that you didn't know existed, right? And you get to become a participant in that work. And, and, and I think a lot of it is finding that space. And then also um, the metrics that we often consider to be success, right? And obviously academic progress is a very important thing. Hello, uh, Senior Vice Provost Dean speaking here. Um, but I also feel um, when I reflect on my university experience and when I talk to students who've had really transformative experiences at the university, um, academic performance is in the conversation, but it usually isn't the top of the conversation, right? Um, and I think particularly in my field of higher education, many of us you know, struggled at some point in our educational journey, right? And that's when we discovered this was actually a thing. There's people at the university who are here to help you or who can um, help you beyond the classroom environment. And, and, and so for me, um, I certainly think one huge advantage we have is, is thinking about success broadly. And what I have discovered in sort of the, I wouldn't even call it the post-pandemic, but this this sort of phase of the pandemic, because I hope everybody's vaccinated and masked up because that is a concern it's still happening, right? Um, one of the things I think about is that my students often need help in framing how they are navigating their journey, which may not be always at the top of the sort of active performance charts, right? And that's, a, that's an important part of measuring progress, right? But an important part of measuring progress is your own well-being, your mental well-being, your health. Um, are you sleeping right? Um, I just saw, you know, um, some thoughts I've had about the importance of making sure we center and advance wellness. Uh, I think Lori, I thought Lori Holland Steiker was on this, but Lori is my colleague and she's uh, our associate dean for uh uh, thinking about things of wellness in our area. And I think that's such an important part of our journey. And so we've almost allowed people to think about um, success, sometimes bereft of that. Like I have performance indicators like a high GPA, but I'm really unwell. I'm doing things that are incredibly unhealthy. They're going to be deleterious to my uh, well-being either currently or very soon after I finish university. So I, I, I like the fact that... Um, I have more students, you know, who are open to, you know, the feedback that I am very much in support and hoping that you are successful academically in your coursework. I am equally concerned that you are well and you're taking care of yourself and you are navigating the space in a way that you uh, are, are healthy, right? And so um, I'm trying to be a good role model. I'm on my Peloton daily to make sure I'm doing what I need to do and I'm trying to make sure I sleep like I'm supposed to. Um, still working on that, but again, we're all works in progress, right? No, that's nothing like making sure we understand that all of these uh, these things we talk about are outcomes, they're goals. They're not that we're there today. And I think a lot of times people, what well, I'm not, my work life balance is not where it needs to be. Well, it's a process, right? And necessarily, uh, you're working towards it. And part of it is being able to reflect on the progress you made. Like today was a good day. This was a good week. This was a setback, but we're going to try to do better in the future. And finding a community of support that uh, sort of embraces that as well, I think. Well, we have a few minutes left, and uh, we have all these great leaders on this call. I wonder if there's uh, someone who'd like to ask a question. 
or make a comment or an observation. Scanning, scanning. RJ Holmes, Dr. Holmes, sir. Thank you. I guess I will make this an all UT um, UT presentation <laughs> and, and, and and ask you, you know, Rich, to 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 go into the future. I want to, you know, reflect on something you said earlier that is very similar to me. Um, I was fundamentally transformed by my higher education experience. I mean, what I have had the opportunity to do now is beyond the wildest dreams of what I would have ever envisioned for myself when I was 18 years old and ended. And I assume that that's true for a lot of others. I worry that we're not gonna be able to deliver that for the diverse set of students that we serve going forward. And I wonder how you think that the Boyer Report will help us get to that point where we're able to continue to deliver on that really transformative promise and opportunity for higher education for all the students we serve going forward. You know, as you were speaking, Archie, I was thinking the same thing. I have a picture that some of you have seen at UT. It's a picture of me when I was probably like 19. And I was flacco. I was really skinny. You can't believe it now, but I was a skinny kid. I'm just standing right behind the tower kind of looking up at it. I don't know who took the picture. I don't know what the framing was, but I work there now. <laughs> like, who saw that coming? And you're exactly right. Um, you know, you, Archie, and me, and many others this call, we, we're often living examples of this. Like, we were able to obtain an educational experience, and we are doing things beyond our wildest dreams because of that experience. And I was actually thinking, like, you know, you know, one of the great things is is taking the boy report and bringing it into a documentary or some kind of uh, engagement. I can see this on PBS being viewed about the promise of higher education, right? And, and I think it's a fair thing to kind of push back, right? We've seen a, a number of, um, of, I guess, provocative films that maybe challenge the worth of higher education. I don't think we should walk through as this, you know, unsullied space that you can't possibly critique or, or comment on. But it is the transformative opportunities that we have here. And it's also not necessarily something that is going to be enumerated through a salary. Um, my friends will tell you that I was, you know, I, I still have graduate student sort of uh, vibes when I see free food because that was my life for one period of time. And I'm not there anymore. It's great. But also, I never was motivated by that thing solely. But we have to sort of make the conversation broader and make the conversation more about democracy. And the provocations, I think, really are valuable for that. Like, let's have a public conversation. Um, and let's talk to uh, folks outside of higher education specifically about things like free speech. One of the things that I think I found challenging about that particular, um, you know, hearing is that, you know, to answer a question about free speech on campus is incredibly difficult to do in a soundbite. It's, it's just hard to do. Um, and I'd love for us to be able to sit down and have a conversation. I often say, Universities are spaces that we attempt to uh, tackle and address issues that we have not successfully uh, attacked or, or sort of resolved societally. So there has to be some grace afforded to the fact that it's not always a straightforward progress. We make missteps, we learn from them, we go back and reiterate. Um, but I think the idea of the university being a walled off constituency that doesn't have, and, and of course, you know, Archie, you, you, you and I know, like, we're really good at one aspect, sports. Everybody feels part of the university there. But could we feel more part of the university when it comes to things like how we manage uh, debates over free speech? How we help develop people and maximize their experiences by also presenting opportunities for them to be challenged and grow. And I always tell people, like, there are no... Um, in my opinion, there are no quote unquote safe spaces on this campus. I talk about brave spaces because the reality is uh, kind of dissonance is part of our learning arsenal here. We often have students who, and I have students who come in and have ways of thinking that maybe align with what I think, but I feel the need to challenge those in some ways. And because I want them to understand that there's more than one way to understand this. And one great thing is that we have this broad swath of experiences to draw on. So when you say, well, everybody thinks this this way, Somebody's like, actually, it's not the way I grew up or it's not the way I had experience. Um, so I think 
making this more universal and, you know, maybe figuring out, okay, if, if to Hillary's point, if sports are our front porch, maybe academic inquiry and engagement is the sunroom or something, something that provides us an opportunity to have more engagement with the uh, broader public and people to feel like the university serves me, even though I may not be enrolled as a student right now. That's a big piece of it. And this isn't just a place where 18 to 22 year olds hang out. Uh, we've got older students, we've got parents. So Jeff Mayo on the call, we've got parents, we've got all kinds of folks who access the university. And I love the fact that people should be able to do that at any stage of their lives. Steve? Yeah, Peter, we're right at the end. Quick question? Well, a quick comment then. Uh, I think it's important that we continue to uh, to strongly take our position, even though politically sometimes it may be uncomfortable about access, about opportunity. Uh, these about I, I loved Archie's comment a moment ago about uh, changing the lives of students with opportunity. I think those are core lessons, even though politically sometimes the word, perhaps you have to wash the words a little bit, but that's uh, the essence of what we're about. I do think that that we need to be sensitive to being sure we're consistent in terms of our First Amendment arguments. Uh, and uh, I think public universities have, have worked at that a lot uh, in, in recent years, and it'll continue to be an issue, but it's important. I also think that it's important that, that we seek out opportunities to, uh, with leadership on our campus and whatever, to opportunities to show of our belief that universities are really a place to exchange views, even though those views may occasionally be contra uh, uh, to, to the predominant culture or, or beliefs of a university. Uh, we're gonna get through this. You look through the history of, of decades, uh, but we need to stick to these core beliefs of access and opportunity. Access, by the way, uh, for people of color, but also poor students, non-traditional age students. Uh, there's those are key things. This, those are my brief comments. I think uh, we worked hard in this report, uh, and we're so pleased that it has such a response. We had a. There have been, I think, the report uh, uh, drew from several years of good experience. So there's data to support. Uh, a big portion of what we uh, put forth there uh, and the response uh, it hit a chord at the right time. And and uh, thank you for all engaging as much as you have today and, and beyond the session. And you know, thank you, Peter, and to Barbara Snyder as well, as I know you'd want us to mention the other co-chair of the Boyer 2030 Commission, the president of AAU is a great team, all 16 commissioners working together. And we're so delighted that um, many, many have found it a useful report, as you were saying. I just want to conclude this um, town hall by, again, thanking the inaugural Senior Vice Provost uh, for Curriculum and Enrollment and Dean of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Texas, Austin, Dr. Richard J. Reddick. This was such a great pleasure. Uh, thanks to Hillary uh, Procknow for introducing Dr. Reddick and helping us move things forward and to all of you for joining us for this live uh, engagement. We will, as we said, you know, post the recording after it's been um, closed captioned and make it available for sharing with colleagues who couldn't have been here today. So thanks to you all for joining us. Thanks again to Dr. Raddick and uh, let's, you know, take heart and move forward uh, with the inspiration they've all provided us today. Thank you so much.